I'm old school, so I'm going to use paper. So I, I, can, I can be old school because I'm, like, old. <laughs> so it's a relative thing. I learned a long time ago that you can't do anything about where you're born, the gender that you're born, although people would argue that, and you can't do anything about your age. Okay, so it is what it is, and, yeah, I'm happy to be here with you. I really am. Uh, <clears throat> my byline, and I told... Uh, Brent this and Micah and now I tell Josh this that if I have the opportunity to invest in a 50 something that has 20 years left or a 20 something that has 50 years left give me the 20 somethings now anybody here in their 20s wave at me okay we'll do 30s then okay 40s wave at me okay and after that it's like you're seasoned veteran that's what you are so happy to have you here Uh, I came to Christ as a result of kids' ministry, VBS. My dad took me to VBS, and uh, I, I know you've got all different kinds of names for it now, but the point is, kids got together and they learned about Jesus. We did some fun stuff, and my dad was planting a church, and so the church couldn't do VBS, so he took me to a church that did. And I really appreciate his investment in my life. And there was an altar call, and he walked up, and, he, and they called me Donnie. He said, Donnie, would you like to ask Jesus into your heart? Now, I didn't know what that meant, but I knew he wanted me to, so I said yes. Now, I'd like to tell you that it was just cursory uh, conversation between a uh, young father and a uh, young five-year-old boy, but I can tell you to this day what I was wearing, where we were at, what I did immediately afterwards, my dad's exact words. I mean, it's just etched in my memory. It was memorable. Kids matter. They're not the church of tomorrow. When Jesus said, let the little children come to me, he identified, he's building their church. Jesus was there to build the church. Let the children come. Let them come. When I walked in yesterday and saw kids in the worship team at a kids conference, I went, okay, these guys get it. They get it. Worship matters. Uh, Last year, Brenda and I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And if you ever get a chance to go to Israel and you go to what they call the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, the Jews are there praying and you can stick notes in the wall. And, you know, it's just a really cool thing to, to go up there and, and stand next to uh, Hasidic Jews that are praying or Jews of any stripe that are there praying. And none of them stand there like this. Oh, God, I just stopped by to say hi. You know, it's not like that. They're either reading the scriptures and going back and forth, okay? They're moving back and forth, or they're speaking uh, Hebrew and they're interceding. Sometimes it's a, me a memorized prayer, sometimes it's a prayer from their heart, but they're always moving. And if you see Jews praying on TV at the Western Wall or anywhere, they're always moving because the scripture says it, to praise him with all my being, and so they've interpreted that to be physical in terms of their worship, that their worship is physical. So capitalizing off of that historic action, I want to give you four worship actions today. Four worship actions. <clears throat> because we try and think of worship as more than music, and, and hopefully you understand that. My assignment today is leading through lives of worship. Like buying a car... You would never look at the car and say, oh, I love this engine, and talk only about the engine. If you got married, you wouldn't look at your wife and say, thank you for bringing those fingernails. Those are just beautiful. I'm glad to be married to those fingernails. The engine is one part of the car. The fingernails are one part of your beautiful wife. Music is one part of worship. And it has to be seen in that light. Now, you can call it a worship service, and you can call it the worship set. I get it. In the same way that you say, let's go to the church, we understand that the church is not a building, that the church is people. Hopefully, you understand that. It's entirely possible that we could revert to the time where churches no longer own property or have buildings. Don't think for a moment that they couldn't be confiscated. The world is evil. 
For 300 years, the church had no buildings and no property at all. And it was during that time that they turned the world upside down with what they believed with following Jesus. It wasn't until AD 300 that churches even had buildings or property. So we say we're going to the church. We understand that. It's actually the church going to a building. You are the church. So don't get confused with the terms. In the same way that a church is people, not a building, worship are the actions of our life, not the music that we sing. So a number of years ago, I worked with my team to come up with a definition. I'm going to throw some stuff, write it down if you want, whatever. Here's my definition of worship. Worship is intentionally living a life that honors God. I'm intentionally living a life that honors God. You were made for God. You were made by God. And until we understand that we were made by God and for God, we won't get it. One of the pastors in our church is, uh, in eastern Washington had a uh, woman come and begin to attend his church. And she said, can I talk with you personally? And he said, sure. And she confessed that she'd fallen in love with another woman. And uh, I have permission to tell the story. And he said, well, that's a problem because, you know, the scripture speaks against a woman being in love and having a relationship with another woman. And, and she said, no, 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 it's okay. I actually had the third uh, gender reassignment from the University of Washington. And I'm really a man. So it's okay if I love this woman. He said, well, now we've got another problem back and forth <clears throat> because... You're not really, you know, discovering who you are as a person. And this went on over a two-year period. Her name was Tony. And Tony became angry with God, then would come back to church, then come back to God. So I've had this gender reassignment, and now I've discovered who Jesus is, and I don't get this, and I want to live my life my way, and you're telling me I can't, and back and forth, until one day there was a knock on Tony's door, and she opened the door in this little town, Colville, Washington. And there stood a 20-something girl. And she said, uh, can I help you? And she said, yeah, I'm looking for my dad. His name's Jim. I heard that he lived here. And Tony, who's dressed fully like a woman, said, I'm Jim. Well, you're my daughter? And she said, I can't be your daughter. I've already got another a mother. I don't need another mother. And turned and walked away. And now, Tony's heart is broken again. And called pastor. George Beers is his name. And sat down with George and said, my life's miserable. What do I do? He said, you need to go back to Jesus. Jesus created you the way you are. You were made by God. You were made for God. Until you come back to that understanding that you were made by him and for him, you'll never have fulfillment in your life. She came clean, confessed her life to the board. The board led, wait for it, a capital stewardship campaign in the church to raise money for surgical reversals at the university as much as possible. And three months later, Jim shows up in jeans and a plaid shirt, cowboy boots and a big buckle, crew cut and a beard. And for the next two years, George discipled Jim until he came into a sweet and full understanding of God who had made him. And he's walking with him. Then he said, I can't stay any longer. My daughters have moved to Texas. I have to go to Texas and be reconciled to both of my daughters. He moved to Texas and over a period of time established friendship, then relationship, then was fully reconciled to both his daughters where he died two years later. Don't tell me Jesus can't fix the broken heart. There's no heart so broken, there's no life so messed up. That's one of the reasons we worship him is because he is the God that takes evil and takes sin and takes darkness and turns it into light and life. My purpose in life is to worship him. So four worship actions. Here's the first one. Number one, worship is knowing and loving God back. Now when I say worship, 
Again, it's more than just singing. It's more than communion. It's more than what happens in the box 90 minutes on Sunday morning. My purpose in life is to worship God. What does a person look like when they worship? What does that look like? Probably one of the most effective verses describing worship in the New Testament is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Because of God's great mercy to us, offer yourselves as living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Someone has said that the only problem with a living sacrifice is it has the ability to crawl off the altar. You can crawl off the altar. I daily offer myself to him as a living sacrifice. You read in the Old Testament about Abraham offering Isaac up on the altar. If you do a little math calculation, you'll come to an understanding that Isaac is probably in his early 20s, around 23 to 25 years of age. And, Isaac, and, and uh, Abraham is probably in the mid-120s, 120, 125 years of age. Okay? Now don't, there's not a 25-year-old out there that can't take a guy that's 125. <laughs> My point being, the act of worship, the act of faith, the act of sacrifice was not just on Abraham's part. It was also on Isaac's part when he laid on the altar, trusting that God would have his will done and that God was fully trustworthy. And later on in Hebrews, it tells us that Abraham knew in his heart that even if he took his son's life with the knife, that God had the ability to raise him from the dead. Not only did Abraham know that, Isaac had to know that. So when you're laying on the altar, when things are tough, when you're in a miserable situation, when it looks like you're going to die, can you stay there? Do you leave when things are hard? Your greatest act of worship might be not quitting tomorrow. Your greatest act of worship might be to endure the pain, to not speak your mind, to sacrifice, to serve, to love. Worship is my response to God's love. God could have said, I don't want to send my son. We forget about the sacrifice that the, Jesus made. We think, okay, Jesus came to earth, lived, started the church, went to heaven, died, and then he went back and everything's all good. No. The sacrifice that Jesus made, he made forever. Before he was incarnate, he was God omniscient, omnipotent, everywhere. Now he is locked into a body for all eternity. When Stephen was being stoned, he looked up into heaven and he said, Behold, I see the man, Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. I see him there. Jesus sacrificed. Jesus could have said, I quit. I don't want to do this. In fact, in the garden, he had this little dialogue with the Father, saying, Is there another way? I want to do your will. Is there another way? Let this cup pass from me. This is really ugly. And every single one of you will have at least one time in your ministry where you will call out to God and say, Let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go through this. This is too painful. It's too ugly. I can't walk this road. And the God Spirit will fill up your life so that you can say, just as Jesus said, not my will, yours. And you know what that is? That's called worship. That's worship in action. You are loving God back. I will trust you not knowing how this will end. I will trust you not knowing how long this will endure. I will trust you. When you came to Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus. You know what that means? It's not your life. You gave your life to him, and he gets to spend it any way he wants. It's not your life. It's not my life. Worship is giving back to God. The question is, what am I supposed to offer God? Well, I give God what he doesn't have. Well, how do you give a God who's got everything something he doesn't have? Mark 12 Verse 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I'm going to love God in three ways. Three ways. Number one, I'm going to love God thoughtfully. 
This is how I give back to God. I love God thoughtfully. I love him with my mind. Thoughtfully. That means I'm thinking about him. Did you know that when you are thinking about God, you are worshiping God? Whether there's a tune involved or not. Thinking is worshiping. To worship God. If you're working a math problem, do you realize that you are actually worshiping God because he gave you the ability to solve the problem? If you're fixing your car, if you're baking a pie, if you're disciplining your children, whatever it is that you're doing, whenever you are using your mind that God created, it's an act of worship. Number two, God wants me to love him passionately. This scripture says that I love God with all my heart and with all my soul. I'm loving him passionately. My emotions are part of that. I was touched deeply today. I sensed this deep impact emotionally when the worship team was singing, It is well with my soul, because I know that story. Horatio Spafford lost his family in 1873. Wealthy businessman, used by God to to put a, a fortune into the ministry of Dwight Moody, the evangelist who was traveling all around. I mean, Chicago was like the center of American Christianity at that part. And Horatio Spafford, this wealthy man, was a big part of that. And then the Chicago fire came and just about wiped him out. His family was headed to Europe. He told his wife, go ahead, take our four daughters. Halfway through the crossing, it crashed with another ship. It went down in 12 minutes. They lost all four girls. He got a telegram two days later. All four lost. What shall I do? In his wife's signature. And upon joining his wife in Europe, when the ship crossed the various area in the Atlantic Ocean where he lost all four daughters, he began to pen the words, when peace like a river attendeth my soul. And he wrote the words, it is well with my soul. The only reason you can say it is well with your soul is if you've come through a time when it wasn't well with your soul. Otherwise, there's no rejoicing in that. Victory is the result of a conflict. Victory isn't the absence of a conflict. Your faith isn't needed if everything's going well. You only know that you can trust God when you find yourself in a situation where God has to be trusted. I'm going to love God thoughtfully with my mind. I'm going to love God passionately with my emotions. And then I'm going to love him practically. I love God with all my strength. That's my abilities. The abilities to serve him in the way that he gave me. God created the entire world. But did you know that there are three things in this world that God will never have unless you give them to him. Number one, he will never have your attention. He will never force you to give him your attention. That's your choice. You get to choose. God will never force you to give him your affection. That's your choice. You can give him your emotions. You can sense his presence. And God will never force you to give him your ability. Your affection, your attention, and your ability. That's what we give back to God. He won't have it unless we willingly give that back to him. And some of you in this room, listen to me carefully. Some of you in this room, God has tapped you on the shoulder and said, go to the next level. And you said, nah, this is good enough. This is all I want to do. And he said, no, there's more. I'm asking you to follow me into more. And you said, no, no, I really, this is, this is, I like my life the way it is. Anybody who says, I like my life the way it is, hasn't fully and completely given their life to Christ. Because he gets to change it anytime he wants. It's not our life. My act of worship is to place my life daily on the altar to him. The second action of worship is focusing my attention on God. Focusing my attention on God. You know, there's a lot of world religions that tell you to simply put your mind in neutral. Come to this place where your mind is in, in, in neutral. But God wants you to think. God never will, he will never tell you to cut your brains loose. Don't think about that. In fact, he, actually the word says to do exactly the opposite. You should think. Think about this. Do you ever find yourself in church on autopilot? Oh yeah, I think I heard this story before. Oh, I know this scripture. I wonder what's on TV tonight. 
What are we going to have for dinner? Some of you have already thought that right now. I wonder how long Don's going to go because I'm actually kind of hungry. You know, where are we going to go for lunch? Where are we going to go? Okay? You, our, our mind can go on autopilot. We zone out. God wants our focus, our attention on Him. We pay attention to what's important to us. Psalms 139. You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I'm resting and when I'm working. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. God's attention is on me. I loved what Di Beale said yesterday about the apple of his eye. The one apple in the entire tree, the entire orchard, the entire field. He's zeroing in on that one precious apple, and that's me. He's paying attention to me. He's watching me. He wants me to succeed. I've heard men say, you know, my wife and my kids say that they don't think I love them. But I do things for them. I do love them. I go to work every day for my wife and kids. Of course I love them. Why don't they feel loved by me? Because you're giving them a paycheck instead of attention. The object of our love has to be the object of our attention. Sometimes wives say, my husband says he just feels like I don't love him. Feels like I'm not paying attention to him. But I respond to his needs. What should I do? One of the things, ladies, that you can do for your husbands is pay attention to your husband before he asks for it. Well, I'm going to respect my husband when he deserves it. Really? Is that how Christ loves his church? I'm going to love my wife when she loves me back. Really? Is that how Christ loves his church? When you fell in love, do you remember that time? When you fell in love, you couldn't get that person off your mind. You were thinking about them all the time. All the time. God has a love for us that's eternal. He's always focusing on us. He's always thinking about us. He's always teaching us. He's always loving us. And he's inviting us to think on him. You know, that's what the word meno means. The Greek word meno. We translate it abide. It's in John 15. Unless you abide in me and I in you, you won't be successful. You can't produce any fruit. It's the Greek word meno, M-E-N-O. It means to abide, to be at home in. I'm going to think about you. Now, God's thinking about me all the time. I can't think about God all the time. When I get on I-5 going home today, I actually think about I-5 for a little bit. I don't think about God. But then after I weave my way into the traffic and I'm headed south, I kind of go on autopilot a little bit. My mind is now free from the demands of the moment, and I can meno, abide, go home in God. So when you have opportunity, do you go home to God? Where does your mind go? There are two things that distract us from purposefully putting our mind on God as an action of worship. Number one, we're self-centered by nature. And number two, we live in a self-centered culture. It's always about me. Well, you know, that works for me. That works for me. It's okay for you. We're self-centered personally. We live in a self-centered culture. Romans 8, 7 says, Focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more about self than God. Romans 12, 2. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it even without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. Why? Because worship is a choice. Your worship of God is a choice. It's a choice. You get to choose. So I can choose to stop thinking about some things, and I can start thinking about other things. You do that, first of all, by establishing a daily time, some kind of routine where you talk to God every day. You get up in the morning. Rather than going to Facebook or email, go to Jesus. Just get up in the morning, throw your legs over the side of your bed, and say, new day, gift from you. What do you got for me? I'm available. Here I am, Lord, send me. It's not my day. There's nothing you did to create the day. Nothing. It's purely a gift from God to you. What you do with it is your gift back to Him. Romans 6, find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God. 
and you'll begin to sense his grace. All of us need to find a place to be with God, just to allow him to speak into our lives. Worship is a constant conversation with God, constant conversation. Psalms 105 and verse 4, worship him continually. Think about him throughout the day. There's a guy I know who set his watch to go off every 30 minutes. It's just a little beeper that goes off, and it reminds him, oh, I need to zero in on Jesus. What does Jesus want me to do today? Every time it beeps. Isaiah 26, 3, you'll keep him in perfect peace who trusts in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You know what you discover? Here's what you discover. When you go home to God in your mind, often you discover that it's easy to go home to God in your mind because you've trained yourself to do that. You've trained yourself. You've equipped yourself to do that. Worship action number three. Worship is expressing affection to God. This is called loving God with your heart and with your soul. This is hard for some of you who come from families that may not be so affectionate. Maybe you're the silent type. You're going to have to learn to grow and learn how to say those words, I love you, to God. Remember the first time you said, I love you, to your husband or your wife long before you were married? Somebody first had to say the words, I love you. Remember how nervous you were to say the words, I love you? Somebody, in, in, neither one of you had said it in your relationship. You've been going out for a while, and now somebody is going to be the first one to say the words, I love you. What makes it so nerve-wracking to say those three words, I love you? Why, why is that so scary? You don't know if you're going to get it back. I mean, they're hanging out there. For all you know, you're going to say to this beautiful woman that you love with all your heart, I love you, and she says, that's nice. And that's not what you're going for. You've got bigger hopes than that. That's interesting. You know? You're hoping that the words go, I love you too. Because you're taking a chance to move the relationship to another level. And you'll never do that without risk. It's exactly like that with God. It's not enough for you to intellectually say the words to God, I love you. I want to challenge you that in the context of your worship experience, you need to be able to feel his presence. You need to be able to feel his love. Now, Jesus took the fear out of this because God was the first one to say, I love you. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. We love, we can love, we even have love in our nature because God chose to love us. Hosea 6, 6, I don't want your sacrifices, I want your love. I don't want your offerings, I want you to know me. I want to challenge you to think about that because there are some of you here today that are still convinced that God doesn't love you. And here's how I know that. You're doing work. You're doing ministry to earn God's love. You have this subconscious understanding of what's called transactional faith. If I do the right stuff, he'll do the right stuff. It's like we've got this cosmic trade going on. It's a spiritual commodity. I go to church. I'm faithful to my wife or my husband. I, I discipline my kids. I tithe. I pray. I read the Bible. I'm in a small group. I do all the stuff. I'm doing good stuff so that I can get good stuff. You know what that is? It's called transactional faith. And what if God tests us? What if God takes us through a difficult time? What if you lose your job? What if some tragedy strikes your family? What if your house burns down? Your parents die. Your spouse dies. And that hidden anger rises up inside. And we say, hey, I did it right. You owe me. You owe me. You know what that is? That's a, that, that's a story of the prodigal sons. The younger boy hated and despised his father so he could get his stuff. But the older boy stayed home and did it all right so he could get his stuff. Neither one of them wanted the father. All they wanted was his stuff. Unrighteous people who live out in the world turn their back on the law of God so that they can get the stuff. But church people... Like the older brother, we all do it right so we can get God's stuff. 
is blessing. But the pearl of great price is not the stuff. The pearl of great price is the Father. Irreligious people disobey God to get their way. Religious people obey God to get their way. But the people of the gospel obey God to get God. God is the treasure. God is the one that we're after. And that's what Jesus is challenging us with in worship. That he is the prize. It's not his stuff. It's not his blessings. It's not his wink and smile. It's him. It's him. Exodus 30 and verse 4. He is the God who is passionate about his relationship with you. God is passionate about you. I want to suggest to you that God loves passion. God made you to be a passionate being. And he longs, you to, longs for you to know that he is passionate about you. Passion is just part of human experience. You know, if I had uh, flowers, my wife and I celebrated 40 years together. 40-year anniversary in June, we've been married. I uh, had to take a missions trip. I was out of the country, and I made arrangements to have flowers delivered the first full day that I was gone. She got them at home, and I wrote a little, you know, I love you. But what if I delivered those flowers personally? What if I walked up to her and said, um, Brenda, I, I have some flowers for you, uh, and I'm giving you to these flowers for uh, three strategic marital reasons. Uh, <laughs> number one, I am your husband. Uh, Number two, it's our anniversary. And number three, husbands are supposed to give wives flowers on their anniversary. So here you go. Okay, what's missing? The passion. It's gone. My heart's not in it. She's not really all that thrilled. She doesn't want my duty. She wants my desire. There's a big difference between worship is duty and worship is desire. Obedience is duty. Obedience is desire. Relationship as duty. Relationship as desire. We express our affection to God by continually giving our life to Him over and over and over and over. When you go to a wedding and you see two people up front on stage are ready to say their vows to one another, what are they doing? They're saying to one another publicly, I have given my life to you. I am surrendering to you. We are entering into a relationship of mutual submission to mutually love one another and mutually satisfy, support, and walk together. That's the essence of love. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can give out of duty, but if you genuinely love, giving is going to be a part of that. And when you say... God, I want to express my love to you. I want you to take my heart. I want you to take my life. I recommit my life to you today. Again, use it however you want. It is impossible for you to not have time to be obedient. There's always enough time for you to honor God with your obedience. Romans 6.13, give yourself completely to God since you have been given a new life. I want to roll back to my formative years, if you'll let me do that. I took my first church when I was 27 years old. And during that era, as, as we rolled into the 90s, there was a shock jock on TV and the radio by the name of Howard Stern. Now, I know it's a previous generation, but let me just give a little wave. Anybody ever heard of Howard Stern? Okay, enough of you have that this will mean something to you, Okay. <laughs> There's a woman by the name of Liz Curtis Higgs. She was one of the best known disc jockeys in America, and she lived a wild life, had no connection with God, no interest in God at all. And Howard Stern said of Liz Curtis Higgs one day, Howard Stern said to Liz, Liz, you better get your life together. You're really living on the edge. Now, when Howard Stern gives you advice to get your life together, that tells you how far over the edge Liz was. Because Liz Curtis had been burned by a lot of guys in her life. She had a broken heart, and she had been hurt. And so she had become, as a result of her personal hurt, a militant feminist. Underscore the word militant. She had a Christian friend, though, who kept inviting her to her church. And one day, after a long time of inviting her, she finally said, okay, I'll go to church with you. And her friend is absolutely excited and hopes that the sermon is perfect. And at church, sitting next to her friend, Liz Curtis Higgs, hears these words, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. 
This Christian friend just went, oh, of all the times to preach on submission, please. That's not a great verse for a militant feminist to hear their first time in church. And her friend looked, and and Liz is just angry. She's upset. Her facial muscles are tensing up. But then she was able to hear the second part of the verse. And husbands, sacrifice yourself. Give yourself for your wives, just as Christ Jesus sacrificed himself for the church and died for her. Wives, Jesus asks you to submit to your husbands. Husbands, Jesus asks you to die for your wives. There's no such thing as a pain-free marriage. Jesus submitted. We submit. Everybody submits. When Liz heard that part, she leaned over her Christian friend, who can't hardly wait to hear what she has to say. She says, wow, I would gladly give my life to any man that I knew was willing to die for me. A few minutes later, her friend leaned back and said, there is a man I know who loves you enough and is willing to die for you. He already did. His name is Jesus. Not long after that, Liz dropped her guard, surrendered her life to Christ, became a believer, and now she has an entire series of books out there. One of her most recent ones is called Bad Girls of the Bible. Some of you have read that. She is an amazing voice. Worship is my purpose in life. Worship is focusing my attention on God. Worship is expressing my affection to God. Here's the fourth one. This is the fourth worship action. Worship is using my abilities for God. Worship is loving God with all of my strength. God wants me to see him. God wants me to sense him. God wants me to serve him. I've been married long enough to know that it takes more than just words and kisses to express affection. You have to know your wife's love language. You have to know your husband's love language. We got home yesterday, and Brenda had taken the patio furniture and stored it in the garage, and it was all clogged up. And I said to her, honey, when we get home today, I won't put the truck in the garage. I'll put all of the patio furniture underneath in the storage area. She got a big smile. She said, thank you for that. My wife's love language is acts of service. If she comes home and sees me cooking dinner or cleaning dishes or vacuuming, it's just like, oh, I mean, kisses are coming. (laughs) That's her love language. There's an action. There's an ability there. And some of you have abilities that God wants to use in powerful ways. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord, not for people. There are those of you here in this room that collect a check from your church and some of you don't. Work hard regardless of what category you're in. Let me me tell you something. A hundred years from now, nobody's going to give a rip how much you got paid. But a hundred years from now, your current attitude will make a big difference. Big difference. It's huge. It's huge. Besides, if you're faithful in a few things, he can trust you with more. So don't complain. Show yourself faithful. God, I will be faithful to you. Some of you try and compartmentalize your life. Uh, this is my worship life and my church life. This is my small group. And I'll, No. God wants to use worship in you to invade every category of your life. It's beyond your career. It's beyond your finances. It's beyond your calendar. The, the, my relationship with Jesus and my worship of him oozes into every crevice of every category of my life. God wants worship to be a leadership thing for you. He wants it to be your whole life and the center of your life. The Greek word heart, cardia, means the center of the... It's not compartmentalized. Oh yeah, it's Sunday. Today's my day to worship God. Got to make sure I don't get caught speeding on a Sunday. That's worse than speeding on a Monday. Can't let a swear word slip on Sunday. Oh, it's really bad. It's my heart. Every day belongs to God. Every day is a gift from him to me. Romans 12, 1. Again, take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. There's that word again, offer. I am offering to him. My ordinary routine, it is worship to God. 
Ladies, when you work around the house. Guys, when you get up and go to work. When you make beds to the glory of God. When you drive a truck. When you sell cars. When you program computers. When you build houses. You do all of that to the glory of God. When you in your ministry deal with angry, frustrated, or disappointed parents in a loving, compassionate, caring way, you are worshiping God in that tense moment. I want you to understand that he's proud of you. He's cheering you on. He's smiling. You are worshiping him. You serve and you honor for his glory. We focus our attention. We focus our affection. We focus our abilities. The Bible says that you were planned for God's pleasure. Leading your ministry through a life of worship is more about what you do and more about who you are than the rewards that come your way. As I close, I want you to think about the greatest area of conflict in your life that you're dealing with right now. I want you to think about that. Where are you feeling tension? Where are you feeling conflict? Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it at church? Where are you sensing conflict? Is it possible that leading through a life of worship could happen in the context of that conflict or tension? Is it possible right now that maybe the best way for you to love God is to offer him your mind, your heart, your strength, your abilities in the middle of that conflict? When we think of ministry, I mean, our eyes focus on the honor, on the joy, on, on the victory, but most of ministry deals with tension and pain, anxiety and conflict, and here's why. Hospitals are made for sick people to come and get well. Churches are made for sinners to come and get well. In church work, you will be dealing with the sickest people of society. That's your job. Now, don't run on that definition too far, okay? Stick with me on that. People are in pain. And you are the one that carries the answer to that pain. That's why your church exists. It's a hospital. It's not a club. It's designed to bring hope. And you are a carrier of hope, and you can't do that on Sunday if you haven't worshipped effectively Monday through Saturday in your own life. You've got to come full, and you can't do that. If, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you've been hurt, it's time for you to get with another brother or another sister and say, pray with me on this. I can't carry this load anymore. Because if you pretend to do quality ministry, eventually the facade will evaporate, and you'll be exposed. You don't want that to happen. Take the challenge early. Deal with it now. Don't wait. There are people hanging in the balance. I want to close with one story. One of the greatest acts of worship that you can do is hang around people who don't know Jesus. Every Saturday morning, I have breakfast with two guys. One guy I led to Christ about five years ago. The other guy's an atheist. I was just with him a few hours ago. He laughs at me. He mocks me. But there was a time when neither one of them were walking with Jesus. And about five years ago, I was in the midst of a writing project, and I met Carl for the first time. And we began to talk. And I recognized what was going on in his life. And he said the word amends, which comes from a recovery background. And I have a recovery background. So I said, you know, have you been through steps? And he goes, yeah, how long are you clean? And he told his story, and I told my story. And he said, I don't know why I trust you, but I just feel like I can trust you. And he starts pouring out his life, that he was rejected by his father, lived with his grandparents until his grandfather committed suicide. At age seven, he found him. And, you know, alcohol, drugs. He said he was with 11 women, married to three of them, in and out of jails, in and out of prison. You know the story. It's all sorted, dark, all that junk. And I looked across the table because I knew I was there to bring hope to him. And I said, Carl, would you like to receive Jesus? He said, I don't know what that means. And we got a hold of that little booklet by Rick Warren called Your Life Has a Purpose. And it took us about a month to go through that. And at the end of that, there's a little prayer. I said, Carl, would you like to pray this prayer and let Jesus come into your life? He said, yeah, I would. I said, okay, I'm going to pray. And then you just pray this prayer in your own words. He said, I don't know how to pray. I said, it's not that hard. Just talk to Jesus the same way you talk to me. He said, really? Use the same words? And I said, yeah, just be honest from your heart. He said, okay. So I prayed. I said, Jesus, this is my friend Carl. We've been talking about you. Now, he'd like to get to know you. 
Can you open your heart and just receive his words as he talks to you today? Because I know you love him. And I said, okay, Carl, it's, a, it's, it's your turn. So he said, uh, Jesus, this is Carl. Uh, I've been talking to Don, and he said that I can just tell you whatever's going on in my life and that I have to BS with you. Only he didn't say BS, okay? Because he's, he's just being who he is. And he opens up his heart, and he pours out. He says, I want purpose in my life. Fill my life with purpose. He was 72 years old. Two weeks later, he comes in, and he says, my grandson's got a hole in his heart. Will you pray? And I said, yeah, we prayed. Stood in front of the trash cans at McDonald's on Ballinger in Mont Lake Terrace. We prayed. God healed his grandson. He came back. He goes, man, this prayer thing, wow. A month later, my friend Paul's got cancer. He's dying. Will you go see him? I said, no, I I don't think I'm supposed to. He goes, I'm supposed to go, aren't I? I go, yeah. So he went down there and he stood in front of his friend Paul and led him to Christ. And he died two days later. A month later, his friend Dick Betty uh, had a heart attack. He went to the hospital, led her to Christ and led the third person. I forget who it was. He came back to me after leading that third person. He said, can we talk to Jesus about getting a different ministry for me? Everybody I talk to dies. <laughs> I want to do something different. Uh, just two weeks ago, we were up at uh, Panera there in uh, Tukwila, or uh, up by the outlet stores. And we were talking, and I said, do you have any family? He goes, yeah. He said, I got a girl pregnant when I was 19, and I just ran off, you know, and there's some boy back there. And I said, do you have any contact with your son? He goes, yeah, once in a while, very rarely. The next day, his boy called him. I said, do you feel like Jesus is working in your life? He goes, yeah, I do. Now, I got to tell you, I've had ongoing relationships. It's harder to do this working in the network office. It's harder to hang around people who are far from God. But if I don't hang around people who are far from God, I forget why I'm working in the network office. If you don't hang around people who are far from God, you forget why you're doing what you do. You have to intentionally get out of this cloistered, protected, Christian, cute, serpy environment where everybody says it right and does it right. And you've got to go hang out with some people who live in darkness. And you have to endure their language and endure their stories because you are the carrier of hope. And if you are unwilling to do that, you will be unequipped to lead children because children will lead other children to Christ. You've got to have that passion for lost people. Jesus came to save you. He's sending you with the very same message as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So now on Saturday mornings when Carl and I pray, we pray for Jerry, our resident atheist. And Carl's language is just like this. He doesn't have a chance. Jesus has got his number. It's just a matter of time. And we're watching God work in his life. I love hanging around lost people. So I want to close with this one last question. With every head up and every eye closed, every head up and every eye open, everybody looking all around, okay? I want to pray with you. If there are people in your life that you know who are far from God and you're willing to dedicate the next few months to praying for them, serving for them, loving them, I want to pray for you. I want to just commission you and pray for you that God will open amazing doors. So if God's calling you to stand in the gap, to reach out to lost people, to actively engage in your community, I want to pray for you. So stand up. Head right to the aisle, come forward, line right across the front right now. You're actually positioning yourself to be a missionary in your community. That's what you're doing right now. This will be your greatest act of worship right here. Your greatest act of worship. You're leading kids, you're training them, but you have to be able to rub shoulders with lost people. You have to do this. Jesus did this. When Jesus came, we were all lost. The whole world was a target-rich environment. We can get so wrapped up in church world and church life that we can't touch lost people. You got to hear their cry. You got to hear their cry. So I'm going to commission you. I'm going to commission you as a local missionary that you are being sent out into your community. Now, do not take this lightly. In just a moment, I'm going to have you raise your right hand, and I'm going to take you in a commission. Some of you might have been in services where I've done this before. That's okay. Do not think this isn't something significant. 
Because when you leave this place today, the Holy Spirit will go before you and you will see people that you prayed about right now and and you'll go, whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen. Or a phone call or an email, something will happen. God will open doors because you now have placed yourself in a place where you said, God, use my ability. Use my ability. I want you to raise your right hand. Repeat after me. Jesus, I'm here today to be commissioned to bring your hope into my community. Holy Spirit, equip me to love my friends and family. Those whose names you're putting in my mind. I will serve them. I will pray for them. I will love them. Someone prayed for me. Now I pray for them. Someone led me to Christ. Allow me to lead them to you. Empower me to see beyond their words, beyond their action, and beyond the darkness. Use me as a local missionary in my community, in Jesus' good name. Father, I pray for these men and women who are here who have offered themselves as living sacrifices on the altar of God. I pray that you will open doors that no one can show. I pray that you will surprise them. I pray that there will be stories that will flow out of this moment of amazing connections that have either been dormant or been very surface, and now their friends want to talk about spiritual things. Father, I pray that the men and women here who have given their life to you in this moment to use as a local missionary will never be held hostage by fear. That when you tap them and say, it's your turn to talk, speak up. Ask if you can pray for them now. Ask if they will come to church with you now. I pray that the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, wisdom, would flow through these brothers and sisters and that they would recognize that God's Holy Spirit has empowered them in this moment. Equip them as only you can for your glory. Let this be a great act of worship on their part as they lead. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Hey, go back to your seats. Josh, come on up. Hasn't Josh been doing a great job? Give him a hand as he comes up.